Each of these people sacrificed something for their country. Winston Norcross, Army Air Corps. They did what their country asked them to do. Robert Reset, Air Force. Every single veteran. Kenneth Darr, Marines. Every man or woman who has served deserves the right to go on one of these flights. Our veterans <laughs> traveling to our nation's capital for a thank you unlike any they've received before. Welcome to Washington. And for the first time, NBC5 News brings you an exclusive look at their day in D.C. Thank you, sir. Thank you. These veterans are so special well, to be around them and just to hear some of those stories. Thank you. Thank you so much for your service. It's just a, a feeling in your heart you'll, you'll never forget. They served our country. The first bomb, they didn't know what was going to happen. 98 bomb group, that's the one I was in. Tale of misfortune was our plane. Well, it turned out it was a tale of misfortune. That's the one we lost. I, I wasn't too scared when bullets were going at me, but when that bomb was coming at me, then I felt terror. Everybody did their part. Whatever they did for their position is important. It was important then, it's certainly important to us. Hear their stories. <laughs> and how our community is lifting them up as they fly with North Country Honor Flight. Thank you for joining us for an NBC5 News special presentation, Heroes Take Flight. I'm Leanne Denyer. Over the next hour, you're going to see a lot of what you likely expect to see. Matching jackets, American flags, scenes from across Washington, D.C. But after hearing these stories and in a way experiencing the impact of an honor flight on our veterans, we hope you feel something new. We hope this story, their stories, propel you to share your own, encourage someone else to tell theirs, help you and your family better understand how our veterans help shape our story as Americans. Thank you, North Country Honor Flight, for the immense privilege to tell this, their story. The monuments that stand in our nation's capital are like chapters in the story of our country. The iconic fixtures, symbols of stories, visible for all to see. Hundreds of miles away in a quiet northern New York community. What year did I do in 66? The signs of Kenneth Darr's love of country are just as apparent. What was sort of going on in the world when, when you decided to become a Marine? You know. He doesn't have many pictures from that time. He often finds himself coming back to this one. This was taken on the ship USS Okinawa. They were very close friends of mine. The man on the left is Frank. Actually, I don't remember the picture being taken. And he can't remember Frank's last name. But there are things about Frank, about their time overseas, and what it was like when he got home that Kenneth will never forget. I think about it every day. Are you nervous at all about traveling? No. The Honor Flight Network organizes trips to Washington, D.C. It's a way to say thank you to veterans like Kenneth. Some of them have been to D.C. before, but they'll tell you this trip is different. Perhaps this story will help you understand why. There's a peacefulness in the morning hours before a flight. Organizers dart about. Good morning. Good morning. You know the routine? They're preparing for the day that's about to unfold. Every single veteran, every man or woman who has served deserves the right to go on one of these flights. We've decided that you don't have to be an actual combat vet to go. Everybody did their part, and every veteran who's ever been in the service knows that once they sign their name on the bottom of that line, they're at the will of the government. They, they go where they're told to go. Sirens interrupt the stillness. Before veterans from Northern New York and Vermont travel to D.C. with North Country Honor Flight. Have a good day, sir. Members of law enforcement escort them from their homes and hotels to the U.S. Oval in Plattsburgh. Good morning, sir. Every veteran we've ever talked to is extremely impressed with this. There's a lot of people that go out of their way to get this done. And uh, it's a great start to a great day for them. There he is. <laughs> Step 
When they arrive, they know where they'll be and for how long. But they don't know what's ahead. Not really. A couple photos. It will be an intense day. Here we go. At all points, the veterans are the stars. I'm honored to be able to do what I do. I, I really do feel that way, that these veterans are so special. And for me to be able to be around them, and just to hear some of those stories, it's just a, a feeling in your heart you'll, you'll never forget. The community wakes up early to wish them well. Good morning. Some are Honor Flight alums themselves, eager and proud to put on their jackets once again. We got word at school that you were coming today. Others want their kids to better understand our history. We're thinking of you at your uh, alma mater. The sacrifices that were made. People have a firm understanding of why we're here and why we're doing what we do. We're all here to wish you a great day and we hope you enjoy yourselves all day long. In these chairs, veterans who served in World War II, Vietnam and Korea. Proud friends and families are mixed into the crowd. Like the veterans themselves, they are trying to take this all in. We call them the honor flight allergies but everybody's got a little uh, little wetness in the corner of their eyes. Robert Brissett, Air Force. There's a hope that taking the flight will empower veterans to open up and share their stories. Bob was a tail gunner, and he was the only one small enough to fit in the tailgate of the B-29 plane. It's Janet Dupree's charge to collect those stories. Just so incredibly important that each of them are recognized for the service that they individually provided. Winston Norcross, Army Air Corps. She sits down with each veteran traveling to talk. When he enlisted in the Army Air Corps as a high school senior. Her words serve as substitutes. Arthur was a great guy. For thank yous she didn't get to give. He uh, was killed in Vietnam in 1968 at the age of 20. Hit by enemy fire. You know we never got to say thank you to him. We never got to honor him. So I'm doing it in my heart every time I talk to a vet. Kenneth Darr. Marines. We still miss him. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that never goes away. In 1967, Ken was engaged in Operation Buffalo. The longtime public servant for the North Country serves as director of operations for the organization. Shane Lloyd. Part of her job is to select the veterans that go on each flight. And the minute I see somebody who's World War II or Korean, um, I mark it so that we know that they're the ones we have to go to. Some veterans have to wait to go to D.C. with the group. Dupree says it can take a few years for some to get on a flight. Thank you. She also says sometimes there isn't time for lists. World War II veterans are aging out on us. The Korean War veterans are. And then we will be concentrating on the Vietnam veterans. So um, I know many of them have held off from sending in applications, knowing that they could be two, three years wait. But I encourage them now to start sending them in. To those of you traveling this morning, we are honored to serve you today. We are humbled by your selflessness, and we are inspired by what you have given us. You are role models to the young people of this community. After this, they're not really pointed out as individuals, and uh, they go as a group. So uh, to get each individual pointed out and, uh, and give them a chance to give thanks and gratitude for what they did for their part in the service, whatever it was, World War II, Korea, or Vietnam, um, it's a special moment. I've seen this 28 times, and 28 times the tears come to my eye to see that kind of support come out for these veterans. Coming up, more emotional moments as our community sends our veterans to Washington, D.C. to see the monuments built in their honor. Plus, I'm over there standing there by the door and he says, hey Bob, get the hell out of here. He says, we can't get out until you do. And we introduce you to Air Force Staff Sergeant Robert Reset. He shares his stories from the skies and why of all the times he flew in his beloved B-29, it's mission number nine that always comes to mind first. Heroes Take Flight continues after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Heroes Take Flight, an NBC5 News special presentation. For most of us, the North Country Honor Flight experience ends when the opening ceremony is over. But for the first time, we're showing you what happens past security, hundreds of miles away in our nation's capital. Just wait until you see this crowd. We really enjoyed the morning over there. There was a terrific crowd of people. I've never seen so many motorcycles in one spot in, in my whole life. All the motorcycles and police units crank it up and uh, they take a lap around the oval and then the parade goes over to the airport. 
It's about a two mile ride to the airport. At every corner, there are kids with their parents, people cheering. There's much more of this to come, the waves, the honking, but this, this moment, some say this is our community at its finest. When you get down to the end of New York Avenue, you'll see two tower trucks with a huge flag hanging over the street and then all the rest of the fire departments. I've seen this 28 times and 28 times the tears come to my eye to see that kind of support come out for these veterans. Oh, it was amazing. As much as they deserve it, to see that many people, it's just truly amazing and it's a huge statement of the people of the North Country. We'll see you up there. Have a great day. Robert Reset always knew he'd end up up here. I was always interested in the Air Force. Even as a much younger man, the Air Force Staff Sergeant. Now this is a B-29 here. Had an affinity for airplanes. And back here is where the tail gunner is. Specifically, the Boeing B-29. The first B-29 that we loaded it took us an hour and a half. And within a month or a month and a half, we had the base record, our crew, we loaded the bombs in 22 minutes. This is our radar operator. The details of Reset's life, his love of planes, country, and family are documented in these albums. 98th Bomb Group, that's the one I was in. Reset enlisted before the Korean War began. When it did, he says the military scrambled to get them ready to get B-29s in the sky. A lot of our troops and everything that got killed, we lost a lot of B-29s uh, hit by other planes. Uh, when I was flying, you know, you'd see the, the flat coming up. The sky would be full of it, and you're just sitting there praying, you know, that you're going to get over and, and get the hell out of there without getting knocked down. Yeah, this is me right here. He was the smallest guy on his bomber crew. He flew 47 missions. The tale of misfortune was our plane. Well, it turned out it was a tale of misfortune. That's the one we lost. Miles high and above Japan, the tale of misfortune was headed out on a mission. And we were up about 15,000 feet. And because of the weight of a B-29 loaded with bombs, uh, the plane is going losing altitude about 2,000 feet a minute. And I heard the uh, airplane commander say, uh, we're going to have to bail out. Uh, when you hear uh, uh, th three rings, uh, he said that means get out of the plane. With a runaway propeller, an engine on fire, and an engine out entirely. You can't see the ground because it's all undercast, about 2,000 feet of fog. And then I remembered reading something about um, bailing out in some book that somebody had, or a magazine. I was back here. I'm over there standing there by the door, and he said, hey, Bob, get the hell out of here. He said, we can't get out until you do, because I'm the first one out in the back. He jumped. I pulled my ripcord too fast, and I wasn't gone from the prop wash, so my um, parachute almost tumbled over, and, you know, I'd have been gone without it. Of the 11 crew members that had to bail out, all of them survived. We landed in a rice paddy right in the mud. Fred Schubert, the CFC gunner, had kind of toppled over. Now, if you ever saw a monk, the way they cut their hair around like this, you know, and it's, he looked just like a monk, and I burst out laughing, and he looks over at me, you know, and I'm as far as from here down to your car uh, from, from him, and he said, Jay Sieber said, what the hell are you laughing about? And he's enraged. I said, Fred, if you could see yourself in the mirror, you'd laugh your head off, too. That's our gal there. That's a plane that we got uh, after. And I remember very well our uh, airplane commander wanted to say, well, let's name this one Tale of Misfortune number two. Boy, we all were against that. No more Tale of Misfortune. We had enough of that. And I'm just fortunate that at my age that I'm still able to walk around and and uh, my wife and I are still together, and uh, then I got out of it okay. Thank you. We made signs. All the kids designed their own signs. This is Koi, this is Jillian, that's Connie. What's on your sign here? The Army guy and the military bus. Thank you for your service. Thank you.
Thank you very much. My husband's an active duty uh, Army officer. I served 10 years in the Army. And we just really wanted to get involved and welcome the, these veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Fewer than 1% of, of the American population serve their country, and I think it's very important to, from a young age, teach them about service to their country and to honor their veterans that made a lot of sacrifices. The crowd that meets the veterans at Dulles is overwhelming. Welcome to Washington. People, strangers, take hours out of their day every weekend welcome. to welcome honor flights from all around the country to their city. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's where our veterans meet Gina Ricketts. This is flight number 28 for them. I've been with them for 27 flights. I come from a military family, thank y'all. so the honor flights are very special to me. And you work with a lot of honor flights, right? Yes. So what makes this, this group different? Their family. I started out as their bus driver. Nice to have you with us today. They adopted me. They actually had me come out to Plattsburgh. I was a guardian for a vet. Uh, wow. I got to see it all from that end. Look to your right and you see all those waves. In the crowd, a girl stands out. She's often in the masses, running alongside the bus as they begin their day. Oh, yes, that was good. As Winston Norcross, the only World War II veteran on this flight, <laughs> begins his day. Nine days after the last one, sailed right into Bikini. Saw the carnage that had happened. Coming up, Army Air Corps veteran Winston Norcross shares his role in Operation Crossroads, why the U.S. military dropped two nuclear bombs after the war was over. That's coming up on Heroes Take Flight, an NBC5 News special presentation. Welcome back. Throughout the show so far, North Country Honor Flight Director Barry Finnegan has been explaining what we're seeing, giving us context for the decision making that goes into planning and executing a flight. For him, this work is deeply personal and part of his story. Both of Barry's parents served in World War II. His father was a sergeant in the U.S. Army Air Corps and his mother a member of the Women's Army Air Corps in the Canadian Army. He attended his first honor flight send-off shortly after they both passed away. And at the time, his son Christopher was deployed in Afghanistan with the Air Force. Barry says he knew this organization was something he wanted to be a part of, that his service is organizing these trips with the hope of encouraging veterans to open up. With Honor Flight, they'll, they'll be more apt to tell you the stories. Um, we've been to homes where the kids, the daughter, the son is sitting there, and they'll tell a story about World War II and, and you find out the kids never heard that story. So they know what Honor Flight does and they understand that and they know we want to hear those stories. And the other thing that happens is we've heard when they come back home, now they really understand that yes, we need to hear these stories. People want to hear what happened, what you went through. And uh, they're a lot more apt to talk about it. Now let's go back to DC for our next stop with North Country Honor Flight. Police officers escort our bus around the city. We're on our way to the World War II Memorial. This has been a beautiful day. Hi guys. Thank you so much. Hi there. I can't get over the amount of people that turn out. Thank you. And that World War II Memorial, when those guys go down there, it's something to see. Some of those guys, that's when things start flooding back to them. Air Corps Basic was a laugh, really. 17 years old, in tremendous physical shape. Where do you want to start? Winston Norcross is fondly known by friends and family as Winnie. Army Air Force drone unit. He's 92. They had motherships and you had drones with remote control B-17s. He served in the U.S. Army Air Corps while it still existed. I kept a log, I guess you'd call it a log. The details of his service are on these pages. What's this saying here? Heard the test over the radio. They are little records. First stop, bikini. Two line inscriptions. Thursday, August 8th. His movements. Entered Bikini Lagoon early this morning. Are all here. A close look at most of the atom bomb victims, the ships. Even with the years behind him now, part of him wishes this log read differently. Really wanted to fly. Didn't happen. Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 
1941. One day after Pearl Harbor, we listened to Franklin Delano Roosevelt or the Declaration of War. Like many Americans, he wanted to do his part. They didn't want us until we turned 18. Too young to ship out, he went to school, then to basic, then... It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. The war ended. The military sent him to Roswell. Some wonderful officers with great war records, and all you hear about is the aliens at Roswell when you hear Roswell, which is too bad, really. From there, the Marshall Islands in the Pacific for Operation Crossroads. This is Bikini. Listen to this. I'm flown how many miles? Six, seven thousand, and they lost my records. Oh, you know where they sent me? They made me a permanent KP, working in the kitchen. A year and a half of college, they made me a, a KP. Uh, I think I cried myself to sleep that night. Eventually, his records did catch up with him. He went back to work on the project as an operations specialist. Everything is in readiness now, and history is in the making. But perhaps you haven't heard of Operation Crossroads before. With almost 500 cameras trained on the blast, the test will be photographed from every possible angle. The goal of it was to better understand the impact of nuclear weapons. The bomber is over the target. The bomb is away. The bombs the military tested were similar to the weapons used to end the war. Here is one of the drone airplanes flying over the target fleet after the blast. There was communication between the guys on the ground that taxied the plane and took it on up. The mothership came along, picked it up, and took control. These planes guided through the center of the cloud column, gathered radioactive dust particles in large filter bags, determining the concentration of deadly radioactive particles is of the utmost importance since invisible gamma and beta rays kill without warning. The military detonated two bombs on a fleet of discarded ships and other equipment. Nine days after the last one, sailed right into Bikini. Saw the carnage that had happened. Japanese aircraft carrier had a deck that was almost destroyed, it looked like a roller coaster. Though the military took precautions. In an effort to reduce dangerous contamination, ships were sprayed with water and special chemicals. Officials deemed the radiation exposure necessary and worth the risk. People were used for guinea pigs. They had one of the uh, explosions early, one of the first ones. They, they had people out there, service people, just to see what the hell the effects are going to be. Tomorrow is the day we leave this place forever, exclamation point. Still, he's proud of his service, of his role in one of the lesser known chapters of World War II's story. I did very little, but uh, in, in my heart, I'm, I'm proud of it. I was ready, I was ready. It just didn't happen, nor if anything happened, the war ended, huh? What are you going to say? Winston Norcross is the only World War II veteran traveling on this flight. Talk about hospitality. Welcome, sir. Welcome to the memorial. On this wall, each gold star represents 100 lives lost. There are more than 4,000 of them. When you get in front of the Freedom Wall, it's a large statement. Organizers know their time coming here with World War II veterans is limited. Each year, a little more so. Really crucial to us to find as many as possible. Um, and I know this, I, I'm speaking for everybody in Honor Flight, it breaks our heart when we open up the paper in the morning and see a World War II vet that has passed away that we didn't know about. Welcome home, brother. Each veteran traveling brings a guardian with them, a family member, friend, or a volunteer to experience the day with. Jim Norcross, a Vietnam veteran himself, joined his father for the trip. I've uh, not been understanding humans for the past few years and today has reminded me that they're still out there. To see all of those people at the airport and everywhere. Thank you for all you've done. And at first I'm like, oh, maybe they're just doing it because they have to. I got the idea today. It's legit and uh, it really means something to them. So 
I'm uh, more of an American today than I was yesterday. If that's possible, I think it is. For Winston, there's one person who stands out. The little girl gave me that. What is it? I haven't really had a chance to read it. Remember her? Before she ran alongside their bus, she handed out notes. Thank you, sweetheart. It says, dear veteran, thank you for your sacrifice. Have a wonderful day in Washington, D.C. Winston worries people will forget Operation Crossroads. A lot of it will be lost in the toys about it. She'll remember. Sorry, dude. Hey, come on. But perhaps today eased that worry just a bit. The ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. At Arlington National Cemetery, our veterans watch the changing of the guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. We'll explain the discreet nod made specifically to recognize honor flight veterans. I, I wasn't too scared when bullets were going at me, but when that bomb was coming at me, then I felt terror. Plus, Marine Kenneth Dar opens up about his time in Vietnam and what it was like to make it home. Stay with us. Heroes Take Flight continues after the break. Welcome back to Heroes Take Flight, an NBC5 News special presentation. When Kenneth Tarr came home from Vietnam, he says he was angry, frustrated with the way many people treated Vietnam veterans. He shares why this trip softened his heart. But first, our veterans visit Arlington National Cemetery. So we're approaching Arlington National Cemetery, 624 acres. It's the final resting place for more than 400,000 individuals. At Arlington National Cemetery. <laughs> Sentinels guard the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Our itinerary is pretty much based around Arlington Cemetery. The ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. Keeping with the dignity of this ceremony, it is requested that everyone remain silent and standing. So when the guards come out and they turn left to go towards the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, if there's an honor flight present, one of the guards will scuff his rear foot. And that's as close to any kind of honor they can show anybody, but that's directed at our honor flight veterans. You can't help but be touched. The tomb is a tribute to lives lost in both world wars, as well as Korea and Vietnam. It's assumed that everyone in this group knows someone who didn't come home. Each veteran has, has his own special moment there. Organizers want to bring as many veterans as they can to see this before time runs out. World War II Korea takes a priority. Vietnam follows that. Um, the other difficult part we're having is the, uh, the ill people. Um, it, it's hard to pinpoint some of these sicknesses, and it's heart-wrenching to see what uh, Agent Orange did in Vietnam. I had Agent Orange. Most people with Agent Orange die at 62, 63. I'm 70 years old, and so far I have no uh, indication of cancer. I guess that uh, makes me the happiest. Kenneth Dar enlisted in 1966. I was in the Marine. Stories from Vietnam had made their way into American homes and schools. We are still around class and talking about it. I just wondered what I was made of. If I was man enough to go there. And that I was. Despite what he'd heard, Dar says he never could have imagined what he'd signed up for. The first thing that came to my mind was Operation Buffalo. I had been there a few months already, and it was a very, it was very bad. We were always outnumbered. Outnumbered and under attack. Sometimes, even now, he wonders why he's here and not a name on a wall. I was on a, uh, on a ship, and we went in to to help everybody out that got in trouble. And usually it was one nine. They were called the walking dead. Sometimes they couldn't help, only pray. And the plane came in and came in and finally opened his doors, doors and dropped a 250 pound bomb. 
That was the most terror I felt in my life. I, I, I wasn't too scared when the bullets were going at me, but when that bomb was coming at me, then I felt terror. 49 people were killed in that explosion. I never got a scratch, and I was the closest one to the bomb. I just think I'm lucky. Oh, the Lord done my side. My brother and I built a fireplace out back, and we put a big cross on the front of it. And how long were you in Vietnam? 13 months. Thumbing through a handful of photos. This is a picture of me walking through Vietnam. Brings him back. And this is a picture of three of us on the ship. To another reminder of the fragility of life. His name is Frank. To another reason. Despite everything, he's one of the lucky ones. And I happened to go on R&R, &R and I came back pretty drunk. And it was my turn to do point the next day. And my friend volunteered to take it for me if I changed places with him to do it the day after, and I said, sure. He took my spot that day, and he never came back. And I forgot him. I think about that a lot. For his service? I don't know how show it. The military awarded him the Purple Heart. He never takes it off. I don't know. I just, I, I'm a very lucky, very lucky man. We're going to all stay on the coach with the exception of our honored guest. Ask Dar why he joined the Marines. Easy answer. My brother was in the Marines, I guess. Probably why. But there are questions. Why did he survive and others die? If I wouldn't have changed for them, I would have been me. In honor and in memory of the men of the United States Marine Corps who have given their lives to their country since November 10th, 1775. I've been, I've been wanting to do this most of my life. It's June 22nd, 2019. I'm glad we could do this for you today. His time in Vietnam. Not let me try it, but let me try it. Always with him. <sighs> Uh, hold me there for a second. Yes, sir. You ready? Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. I've been wanting to do that for years. Kenneth Dar, always faithful, always loyal to the men and women who won't join him here. All I can say is the Corpsmen are beautiful people. They have to be one of the bravest people I know. They go into battle without a rifle, without any weapon for protection at all, and they're there to keep you alive. And they do it. I respect the corpsmen more than anybody. I've been wanting to do this for so many years. Oh, I meant a lot, more, more, than, more than a lot. <laughs> Now I have good memories I can think about. A memory to keep close to Frank, the thoughts of bombs and anger. On this day, something new. Beautiful, isn't it? Kenneth shared he was exposed to what's called Agent Orange during his service. The military used the herbicide to kill trees during the war. The chemicals removed tree cover, cleared vegetation, but now there are serious health concerns about the impact that kind of exposure had on members of the military. Some of the diseases associated with Agent Orange include Parkinson's, prostate cancer, and Hodgkin's disease, as well as others. However, it's difficult to test for the level of exposure. So the VA assumes anyone who served in certain places at certain times was likely exposed and are in turn eligible for care. For more information, you can contact Albany Stratton VA Medical Center at 518-626 join. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Now that you've gotten to know Winnie, Ken, and Bob, we hope you better understand why visiting the memorials has such a profound impact on Honor Flight veterans. Now, more from the day with North Country Honor Flight. I don't know the degree of emotion is as strong now as what it used to be. For Bob, it's hard to pinpoint. For a moment, there's different things that come up and then they pass on. The feelings being here brings about being in front of the stone faces and in front of the memorial wall. When the war was over, did you feel that people understood what had been going on over there? Not really, not in any depth. They read the newspapers or something and watch the news and they'd get glimpses of it and 
they had their own mindset on what was taking place, which was, you know, quite a distance from reality. At the Korean War Veterans Memorial. We're from Plattsburgh. We my, saw you guys took off this morning on Facebook. In Welcome Korean interruptions. Thank you for service. Thank you, sir. Punctuate moments of reflection. You look back at it and uh, it's fleeting uh, because some things were very traumatic and uh, left me with, uh, with some, you know, hard experiences. My wife will tell you for years I didn't say a word about it. You know, anything that happened and then, you know, it's sort of mellowed and uh, I, I can talk about it a little bit more. Keeping stories close is especially common amongst those who served in Vietnam. Nobody deserves this trip more than a Vietnam veteran. Here, the names of 58,000 servicemen and women are etched into the granite. 58,000 people who will never see this place, 58,000 who will never take in the magnitude of all those names. For those who made it home from Vietnam. They hated us when we first came back. There were no ticker tape parades. There was nobody thanking them. There weren't people out on the streets welcoming them then home. We used to be called baby killers, and that bothered me a lot. A lot. Why? I don't know. No different than any other war. War is war. It was tough knowing Arthur was over there fighting for a war that people were saying some awful things about, and I'm not saying they, some ways they weren't justified, but when you have a loved one there, it is really hard. I gave him 23 years. I had 22 good ones, one year in Vietnam. That was not considered a good year. In Vietnam, I was on the USS Fort Marion. Shane Lloyd served as a sailor in the U.S. Navy. A lot of Vietnam vets were just ignored when they came back from the service. And I am so glad to see the veterans at least get the thank you. Thank you for your service. Organizers say of the three conflicts they primarily work with, <laughs> Vietnam veterans tend to be the most hesitant about the trip. We can't make what happened go away, but uh, we hope they realize that that sentiment doesn't exist anymore, and we're proud of them. Even as the day winds down, Thank you. people keep turning up. That one for me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it is the best. I can't imagine how many people it takes. I mean, I do a lot of volunteering, but when I get home, I'm pretty sure we're going to start volunteering for the Honor Flights in Minneapolis. It's so nice to be able to get back. We're the local Dulles Airport ground crew for Honor Flight. I get here like two, three hours before the flight. We decorate, um, make sure all the lists are in order, and go from there. But yeah, it's an exhausting day. The police escorts, the park police escorts, they give up their day off to come out and escort the vets around. I am just so impressed with the quality and the quantity and the dedication of, of the volunteers who, who work in this group. It is over the top. It was really, it was impressive. There you go, okay. But before they go, open her up. There's mail call. When they were in the service, they were looking forward to mail call. This is their mail call for this flight. It's letters from families and school kids. Look at all these thank you notes. Messages to lift them up. What do you think? It's, it's just super. As they head back home. You know, you get a big charge out of it, to tell you the truth. You know, it's unexpected. You don't encounter that every day. Very rarely do you get a chance to change somebody's life to change the direction they're going in. Oh, it was wonderful. Priceless. It's just great. Here, every place we went, they lined the route. I've been a wish a thousand times. Thanks for my service. Somebody on every flight stands out. How grateful are you to be here today? This is very special to me. Took him two attempts, but he, he got there and it was amazing. And it touched me. All right, welcome home. Thanks everybody. You know, you hear a lot that this is the best day of my life. You can tell by the hugs and the handshakes and the little tear in the corner of their eye what that meant to them.
what a tremendous privilege and honor to be able to work with these veterans. You're doing, buddy. You made it. Just their expressions, just their feelings, their emotions. That's what we want, and, and that's what we do this for. We're blessed here. Our community is just overall giving and loving community. The vast majority of the money that Honor Flight has to send our veterans on this, one of the most incredible days of their life is raised by volunteers, by people who give, by people who will write out a check. Every single dollar counts. Almost all of it comes from our community. So we're hoping to reach every veteran that's out there just saying, you know, please sign up, give us a call, and uh, we'll get you down there. Everybody's earned and deserved that, and we hate to see anybody miss out. We hope you and your family have enjoyed the program tonight. And now that you've seen what the trip involves, we want to let you in on one more piece of this story. How a group of students with an idea made their mark on Honor Flight. How much money do you think you're going to raise when you first start again? Not enough for a flight. Like maybe 7,000. The seventh graders at Beekman Town Central School know a thing or two about giving back. Here in Beekman Town in the middle school, we do what's called project based learning. They're learning soft skills and uh, skills that are going to benefit them later in high school, but also as members of the community. Honor Flight veterans often come into the classroom to meet with students with hopes of helping young people better understand a different time. Our whole team wanted to do more for them and kind of give back because of what they've done for us. And that's when the idea of the fun run came up. Uh, at first I thought that it was going to be a crazy idea. Um, you know, 106 kids uh, planning a run, and no one on the team had ever planned a run before. They decided people would run as the veterans left for Flight 27. So they went to work, contacting sponsor after sponsor after sponsor. The day of it was just, we were, we were all blown away. And then there was a bunch of people running. At the midpoint of the ceremony, you'd see the fire trucks and the motorcade. It was really fun and uh, something I'd never forget. So you might be asking yourself at this point, just how much money did they raise? We got 19000 When I realized that we had raised $19,000, almost twenty, I was really happy. And we are absolutely uh, thrilled to be here this morning. Happy tears fell during Flight 28's opening ceremony. On behalf of our school and on behalf of the entire community, we're proud to present you with this check for $19,000. Barry, when we handed him the big check, he was crying tears of joy. Yes, everything you've seen so far was paid for by these kids. Just to see all their smiles, that was really moving. The kids, they went out and they worked hard, and it wasn't the teachers doing that, it was the kids, and it was just a remarkable job. And the students did so well, there's money left over, helping cover the cost of another flight. To turn out that kind of money, you know, to not only pay for that flight, but part of another flight, uh, just overwhelming. We never saw that come in at all. How did that make you feel? Um, it made me feel proud because we got to help a ton of people. They did so much for us and they put their lives at the risk and there's really no bigger thank you than sending them to see their own memorials. Having children, you know, thinking of veterans and having that feeling of country was uh, really, you know, really bit into my heart to see uh, this group from Beatman Town, uh, these seventh graders uh, putting out like they did and raising that amount of money was, you know, just overwhelming. The students told us they're eager to plan more fundraisers in the future and to teach the new class of seventh graders about what they've learned. If you would like to help, North Country Honor Flight is always accepting donations. For more information about upcoming flights, how to sign up a veteran or become a guardian, head to NorthCountryHonorFlight.org. And of course, there are so many more veterans, people involved with this organization who didn't make it into our program tonight, which is why we're hoping to continue the conversation on Facebook. Share your stories, pictures, or thoughts about what you've seen tonight. Thank you for joining us, and to all who serve and have served, thank you for your service. Good night.